All right, so I'm, we're going to talk about um, Jupiter and how it, uh, the kind of multi-language nature of Jupiter and how, uh, how Jupiter evolved out of IPython and why Jupiter is no longer called IPython Notebooks um, and how it's, even though we're at PyData and um, we, we feel very much at home at PyData with all the notebook demos and everything um, that we're on the Jupyter side, we're not, we're not just about Python, that we want to enable people to do the cool stuff we've been doing in IPython in a variety of languages. So to start out, uh, we've got just a little bit of, of, of architecture of, of how this stuff works. Of, we have IPython, which started out as you know, just better interactive Python in the shell. Um, you got Python execution, and then input and output in a terminal. And then as a part of building things like the notebook, we, had, we added um, essentially a protocol for how you get input and output from the Python execution uh, to the person. So we, we abstracted, rather than talking directly to the terminal from Python code, we abstracted a bit of how do we ask to run code, and then how do we communicate uh, the outputs that are the result from that code and communicate that to uh, the person running the code. So what, and this is, this is always a source of confusion, what's IPython, what's Jupyter? We get, um, you know, we get these questions all the time of, wait, is that actually an IPython issue? Is it a Jupyter issue? What repo do I need to report this bug on? Um, you know, who's, which project is responsible for this feature that's not working properly, or that's amazing that I want to help out with. Um, so IPython, which is um, the I, is for interactive. It's an abbreviation, which is why we capitalize the I. We always capitalize the I in IPython. Um, it, it, is, it is not an Apple product. It's just interactive Python, regular abbreviation. Um, and it provides you know, better interactive Python. Extensions to the language, like Magix, uh, you know, the kind of more shelly syntax for LS, C, you know, CD, the time at Magic, um, adds better completion, introspection, you know, showing you doc strings, all these things. These are these are IPython features for interacting with the Python language. And Jupyter is all the stuff that we use that's generic and that we use to talk to, to Python. So we've got this messaging protocol that we use to say, OK, I'm at, I want you to run some code. I want you to display some output. OK, here's the output. I know how to display it. It's also this document format. So all these notebook presentations uh, that we've seen are these notebook JSON documents that encapsulate the input, the output, um, markdown and, and uh, a bunch of metadata. So we store things like um, slide transitions for the, the nice live notebook demos that we've seen here. Uh, those are stored in metadata on, on the cells that, that we use to kind of take a notebook and then render it as a reveal JS presentation, for instance. And then we've also got things like the notebook application. When you're running the notebook, that's an application for building, for running code, viewing things. Um, and actually producing the notebook documents. Um, and then we've got a variety of tools for either working with the notebook document format, like NB Convert, which is our tool that says, OK, you've got uh, a JSON uh, document that's got output inputs and outputs, and I want to plug that into my publication pipeline, whether that's a blog that wants markdown, or whether that's your Sphinx documentation. Um, you want to write your Sphinx docs as a notebook. Um, or you've got, um, you know, you want to write an academic paper and you want to generate some LaTeX or PDFs for, um, for a more traditional publication pipeline. And then we've also got services around, in, um, around uh, notebooks and NB Convert. So we've got NB Viewer, um, where you can go to find, you know, you can pub publish any uh, raw notebook anywhere on the internet, and then you can click a link and it will render that as an HTML page so that anybody can actually see the nice, you know, rendered um, input and output of your notebook uh, without having to have the kind of authoring software that, that you use to make it. And then we've got tools surrounding deploying notebooks. So Jupyter Hub is a multi-user server that we use for hosting classes or research groups 
So you can, as, uh, as a user, you can log in and get your own server on those resources without, um, and helping sysadmins deploy that without having to open a bunch of ports. It's each notebook server listens on its own port. Jupyter Hub puts up a proxy so that you only need to have one regular vanilla web server, um, and then everything happens behind the scenes in terms of giving each user their own server to work on. And all the stuff that's Jupyter specific, that's you know, deploying notebook servers, the notebook document format, um, the messaging protocol. There's actually nothing Python specific about any of these things that, you know, if um, when you're executing, it's here's some code. Um, you need to say what language it is for the highlighting, but um, it doesn't, there's nothing Python about, you know, here's a string of text, run it, produce some output. And similarly, the outputs are, here is um, a representation of some output. There's nothing, it doesn't matter what, you know, what language the code was that ran it. So a bit about the protocol that we use. We use uh, a, a bunch of sockets from a networking library called 0MQ, um, where the kernel, which is what we call the process where code runs, has a collection of sockets that listen for particular kinds of messages. And then you can connect clients to those sockets. You can connect a full client, like we use in the notebook, that connects to all the different uh, sockets for gathering output, for requesting execution, and for uh, responding to raw input requests. Or you can actually, you can connect services uh, to a kernel that actually provide less than all that functionality. So you can, you can write a little service that just listens to the output publication and that just logs all the outputs produced, or actually logs all the execution, uh, all the code that somebody asked to run. So you can actually have services sitting next to a notebook um, that is doing, you know, saying, oh, somebody asked this code to run on this kernel. So how, what do these messages look like? So ZeroMQ is kind of the transport we use. It's a socket library that gives us some, some nice features. But um, to format um, at a high level is really a um, just a Python dictionary with a, uh, there's a header with some information about the message, and then there's a body that's like what what is the content of of the message that you're that you're trying to send. So when you type in a notebook print hello world, the browser builds a message um, with a type execute request. So you're you're requesting that some code be executed, and then the body of that message. Um, is has some code, and that code is print hello world, right? So you're just, I've typed some text in a box, and I've said, hey, kernel, please do whatever you think this text means. Um, and so there's no knowledge in the front end of what the, what the code means. Um, and this has advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that we've got this super generic protocol that anybody can implement. Um, there are disadvantages in that you can't, um, it actually makes it harder for us to do um, kind of clever language inference things in the front end. So once you've submitted this execution, then you get a reply that says, okay, it worked. You know, here's the prompt number that you got that we put in the little in and out boxes. Um, and if it didn't work, you'll get a trace back. And that comes back on the same the same socket, so you submitted a request and you get a reply straight back. Um, and there's a side channel that we call IOPUB um, where outputs and things happen. These happen on a different socket that's a 0MQ publisher socket, so it's actually broadcast to everything that's connected uh, to the kernel. Um, they all get the same outputs. And one of the common ones is a display data message. So what display data is, this is the, the, the rich mes uh, message we use for, oh, I've got something that I want you to put, uh, I want you to show. Um, and in addition to the kind of plain text that we've got in a, in a terminal, say, this, this object actually has multiple representations. I know the simple text representations that in Python we just call repr. Um, but in this case, it's also got an, an, SVG, implement it, an SVG representation or a LaTeX representation or a, a PNG representation. And then it sends those as what we call a MIME bundle. So it's a, it's a, a dictionary keyed by MIME type saying these are all representations of the same object. 
and then the front end says, I like the, you know, I, I understand text. I can always display text. I don't think we have any front ends that can't display text. Um, but I really like SVGs. So if there's an SVG, I'm going to pick that in, instead of text. And different front ends have different uh, display priorities that say, you know, I technically can do this. One of the um, interesting examples is the, the Qt console, which is another front end for the same uh, Jupyter kernels. Um, it understands uh, many formats, but it, um, some of them it doesn't implement very well. Um, and so it actually has a different display priority uh, than the interactive notebook because um, certain display types actually behave better than others. And then you can also have, um, you can use this MIME bundle format for things like NB convert. So let's say you're, you want to produce uh, a PDF with LaTeX. Um, often what can be useful is vector formats like a PDF uh, figure. Um, those don't display very well in the live notebook, um, but PNGs don't look very nice in a LaTeX PDF. So what do you do? Um, you can, in IPython, um, say, matplotlib, when you publish a figure, um, give me both the PNG and the PDF. And the live notebook is going to say, oh, I got a PNG. I like those. I'm going to display that. And then you can, when you go through and be convert to LaTeX, it says, aha, there's a PDF version of this figure. I'm going to use that instead of the PNG. So you get a nice vector, um, a nice vector figure in your LaTeX PDF, and then a nice high DPI raster figure um, in the live notebook. And you get all of these um, from the MIME bundle representation. And various message types that we've got. So we've got execute request and reply. That's the standard um, kind of read eval uh, loop that we have. Execute input. This is something that every time, every time you execute a message, the kernel actually broadcasts, hey, everybody who's listening, I'm about to run this code. Um, and then we've got display data, which we use for representing rich, um, rich outputs. Stream messages. These are what you get for when you type print, when you write to standard in, standard out. These are just plain um, terminal text. And so these get processed through um, you know, ANSI escapes and stuff like that. And then error messages, which have tracebacks. And then execute result is, here's, here's the result of, of, uh, of the execution. Um, status messages. These are, if you've ever seen the, the little circle that's filled or, or empty, these are um, how the kernel communicates. I'm doing some work. It says, I'm, I'm busy now. And then when it finishes, it says, I'm idle. So that you get a little indicator of um, when your kernel is available for doing work. And then we've got additional uh, messages like inspect request. And so this is what happens when, in, if you're in an IPython notebook, an IPython notebook is still a meaningful term. It means you've got a Jupyter notebook and you're running the IPython kernel. Um, so if you type a function and then you hit Shift Tab, you get this little pop-up of the doc string um, saying, you know, what, you know, show me some, in where as far as Jupyter is concerned, it's saying, show me some information about uh, kind of where in the code the cursor is currently. Um, and then we've got complete requests. You know, these are your standard. You hit tab to complete, and it says, it asks the kernel, you know, what, uh, what symbols might I want to, to add here? And then we've got a document describing all the messages in detail. This is a very long, doc detailed document that it should be, should be, at least, you know, the reference that you need for if you want to write your own kernel, this is, this is where you start. This is, this is the protocol that you want to implement. Um, this is what a message looks like. And we've got all the different, different categories of messages and the wire format and all these things heavily documented for um, going out and building your own kernel. And people have done this. Um, there are currently over 50 kernels that have been written. I was. Um, uh, sitting with David Pugh a little bit. Apparently, there are like five Scala kernels. Um, not entirely sure. I guess nobody's happy with what anybody else is doing in, in that um, community, but it... <laughs> fair. Um, but there are lots of kernels. Um, and the, the really important thing here is that um, we, the, the Jupyter and IPython developers, um, 
are major contributors to very, very few of them. That our main contribution is, you know, we're working on the UI, we've got this protocol, um, and then people say, oh, I want to, you know, and Andrew Gibiansky says, I want, you know, I want to use this notebook in Haskell. Um, and so he wrote, you know, he wrote the kernel side um, in Haskell, and now we've got this wonderful Haskell notebook. Um, and the same thing has happened in the Julia community. Um, and Thomas started the R kernel, and um, that's getting picked up. And, um, and Sage uses it, and there's Erlang, there's Go, there's C++ even. So there's, in terms of writing your own kernel, so let's say there, you know, you, you've got a project, whether it's a, you know, a DSL that you're working on that, you know, you, you use in your company, or you've got some language that isn't supported, or you merely want to do something IPython-like, you want to extend the language and kind of give, you know, modify the execution semantics, add things like magics um, to the language of your, uh, of your choice. There's, there's three kinds of, of kernel. The, the canonical, you know, the first class kernel um, is what we call a native kernel, where the entire kernel machinery is written in the language of the kernel. And that's what IPython is, that's what Julia is, that's what the R kernel is. So the Julia kernel is a, a Julia package that's written all in Julia that implements the wire protocol and messaging protocol um, for, for executing code. Um, and the same is true in IPython and R. But the IPython package actually has taken, um, this is work that, that Thomas mostly did, has taken the, um, its implementation of the message protocol and kind of put that in a, in a simple base class. And so what you can do is write what we call a wrapper kernel. And so we've got a Python object that implements the, um, the message protocol and then it's, this kernel class defines a few uh, uh, methods that are like do execute, um, do you know, completion. And all you need to do is subclass that and define those one, two, or three methods, and then you've got a kernel. If you know how to, with a Python API call, run code in your language, um, you can use that uh, to get yourself quickly up and running. With a uh, with a kernel in your language or your um, you know your particular application, and we've got a, a nice document describing you know going through basically an entire example of this is in fact a completely working kernel that does execution where the execution semantics are defined as um, uh, printing um, the code that you typed. You can do, the execution semantics are totally arbitrary. You can say, do whatever you want with that, with that text. It could be you know, rendering restructured text to HTML. It could be you know, any, anything that's text input and any number of outputs you can write as a kernel. And this wrapper kernel machinery uh, makes, it, uh, makes it easy to, to, to write more and more of these. And then the last piece that uh, we also ship is um, what we call a REPL wrapper kernel. So this is taking the REPL, the wrapper kernel machinery, um, but wrapping a, a kernel that already has its own terminal wrap, terminal REPL. So like take uh, Bash or um, recently uh, I worked on a kernel for a, a C, interactive C++ interpreter called Kling that has its own terminal interpreter for if you wanted to type C++ at the terminal um, interactively, that's something you can technically do. Um, and so I wrote a wrapper around, uh, around that. And you know, this is the most limited kind of kernel, but sometimes it's all you've got. If, if the only way you, you have, the only API you have for evaluating code in your language is instantiating that language's own existing REPL, um, you can use this to, to, uh, to bootstrap and get that into the, um, into the notebook. And the um, con reference example of this is the bash kernel, um, which instantiates a bash interpreter, sends it code, gets, and gets standard in, standard out, and stuff like that. Um, the, normally, when you have one of these REPL wrappers, you don't get, you only get plain terminal output. You don't get the rich MIME-typed output. 
Bash is a peculiar exception to this in that there's the Bash kernel provides a uh, fancy mechanism for actually displaying images and things um, that I won't get, go get into how that works, but um, it's kind of a cool tool. And so taking an example of, of things like this, of I wrote that, that toy wrapper for Kling, the C++ interpreter, um, just during a break at a Write the Docs conference in Portland. Um, and uh, I wrote that as a REPL wrapper of just, I can, you know, you've got an interpreter, I can wrap it, here it is, it's a toy for interactive C++. Turns out people at CERN use this, the people who made Kling actually use this for um, actually doing analysis of the scientific uh, results from their accelerators. So they actually, you know, they're invested in Kling and they have people who want to use it in the notebook. So in December, Thomas and I went to CERN to talk about Kling Kernel and Jupyter Hub and many other things. And one of the things we worked on was actually promoting the Kling Kernel from this REPL wrapper to actually adding APIs to Kling itself so that we could move Kling over to being kind of a regular uh, kernel where we're actually calling Python C APIs. So we're saying instantiating a Kling interpreter in the current um, process and then passing code for it to execute and capturing output um, in a more natural way. And the su uh, success of this is, you know, we went from a toy that I wrote, you know, on, on a lunch break at a conference to actually being a real part of the Kling um, project itself. So the, the kernel that we worked on at CERN is now actually part of Kling. So if you install, you know, LLVM and Clang and Kling, then you actually get um, a, a Jupyter kernel for doing interactive C++ in the notebook. And now Thomas is going to take over and do some demonstrations of uh, notebooks in a variety of languages. All right, demo time. So Min mentioned that most of the variety of kernels are written by people out there in the community who are using whatever language and not by us. Um, but, you know, we we also use other languages, and we do have some role in some of the other kernels, uh, like the Kling kernel that Min initially wrote. Um, so it's some of those that I'm primarily going to be demonstrating here. So. Hmm. so first off, I'm going to start with the R kernel. So this is... This is a native kernel, it's a first class kernel completely written in R. And you know, you can run some simple R code. And here where you've where I'm displaying an R data frame, you can see that it's producing the rich representation HTML output. And similarly, if I do a plot, then it creates the um, I think that's doing using a PNG representation to put it into the into the notebook. Um, and the plotting can also do other formats. And one of the kind of one of the challenges with writing other kernels and using this display machinery is that the Jupyter protocol defines how you actually send these different formats over the wire, but it doesn't it doesn't do anything to it doesn't say anything about like how that is integrated into the language in different ways. So Python has this notion of this special method, double underscore wrapper, and we kind of extended that in Python. So you have like wrapper HTML, wrapper PNG, and whatever. And we look for those methods to decide what we can display. Um, in our things, R doesn't have a, a direct equivalent of that mechanism, um, but we've written as part of the R kernel, there's a library for R called Repa, um, which defines, so R has these, these kind of generic methods. So we've defined a generic Repa HTML method, and then anyone can implement, so for example here, the Repa HTML data frame, maybe that's a bit bigger, um, that's, the, that's the method that is used to display that HTML data frame. And these can be, so REPA defines these 
these methods for a bunch of a bunch of common classes like data frames and plots. Um, if you're writing an R package, you can also include the the implementations of these with with your code. And if you're using an R package and you want to you want to integrate it better with the notebook and you know it's not something that the authors of that package have supported or Repper itself has supported, then you can define define that generic method for for that type and it will work. So bash is another thing that I've I've worked on. So this is right at the other end of the spectrum. This is a, um, a REPL wrapper kernel. So it's running here. A back, uh, the, the kernel process that the notebook is communicating with is a Python process. And then that is running yet another process, which is a bash, a bash terminal running in a, a PTY, a pseudo terminal. Um, so I, I think this won't work on Windows because it requires Unixy features, um, but then you don't, you don't tend to use Bash on Windows anyway. Um, so you can do all of the things that that we do in you do in Bash. And this is just to highlight that. So normally, when you do a man command, it would show up in the pager, and so part of what the kernel does is to make to make bash fit better into this, it sets the pager to cat, which will just pass the, pass the input through to the output without any change. Um, so rather than, rather than trying to start up less, which would get the kernel into a horrible mess, I won't run a less command here because it will break things. Um, it just pipes things like that through to the terminal. And you can also do things that wait. And I probably shouldn't have made that wait for so long. There we go. Um, and then, as Min mentioned, there's a display function. So you can pipe an image into this display function. And it saves it off to a, a temporary file somewhere, and then sends through stood out this like special, special token to say, like there's an image to display, and it's in this file. So that's kind of like a different, another take on like, you saw the, the repr HTML generic method for, for our bashes equivalent is like a, a bash function that you can pipe data into. So here's a, a Julia example. Julia is, other than IPython, it is the most complete kernel and that extends as far as Julia implements widgets. So you can use this Julia package called Interact. Again, let's just make this a little bit bigger. And here I've got some sliders, and as I drag them around, the color of this bit of text will change. And similarly, I can draw a plot like this. And as I move the slider, it will, in a moment, hopefully, Curse of doing live demos. OK, well, maybe it's not going to work today. It should update live anyway. We can't have everything work when I'm doing a live demo. So that's kind of the, the Jupyter take on multi-language support, is you have like each, each notebook associated with a kernel, which usually means a particular language. But Asmin was saying, like, the the kernel can do anything at once with the, the text that it's getting from the front end that represents usually some kind of code. And so there's no reason that you can't build multi-language support in at the kernel level as well. And indeed, this is part of what we do with IPython, and various, various projects exist to support this. So this is, if I just start this. Hmm. So this is our integration with NiPython. So I have a, a Python notebook here. And using RPy2, which is a Python R interoperability library, I can start a cell with this percent percent %R cell magic. And then all of the code within that cell is treated as R. 
and this is actually, so we have a variety of these magics. Some of them run inside, some of them run the code in a different process, so it has no, no real communications with the, the Python kernel. The R1 goes a bit further, so it's loading R and running the code in the same process as Python. So we can do things like if we've got, this is a, a pandas data frame with, this is data from Yahoo Finance for the Google stock. Then if we do an R cell magic with this dash I for input DF command, that takes the, the pandas data frame and it works for other, other kinds of thing as well and transforms it into R. So that's now an R data frame and you can do operations with it. So here's a, um, this is just building a simple regression model um, to see if the, the change in stock price over a day is related to the amount of that stock that was traded or something. You can tell I'm not a finance person. Um, but yeah, the, you, can, you can move your data very quickly and easily from Python into R. And so you can, you can do like your input and preparation steps in Python, for, for instance, and then move it into R to do some statistical test that may not be implemented in Python. So yeah, this is, this is that kind of thing. So there are, for a whole variety of languages, just about any, any sort of scripting language that can take code on standard in and run it, we can, we have, or we can easily have a cell magic that will just start that process, start that interpreter in a separate process and throw the code into it, um, which is, I mean, that's kind of the, the magic equivalent of a REPL wrapper kernel. It's very, very quick and easy to do, but very limited in what you can do with it. Um, there are R and Julia magics that load the relevant interpreter in the same process and um, that lets you pass data back and forth. Um, and there's a Cython magic, which will use Cython to compile a function that you define, and then you load it directly into your namespace. So you can define a, a Cython function in one cell and call it from Python in the next. So yeah, some of the, some of the challenges that we've encountered in this, um, I mentioned the different different kinds of rich display mechanisms and how that fits into each language. Um, getting good zero MQ bindings for each language can be tricky. So um, MINS, MIN maintains the zero MQ, zero MQ bindings for Python and does so very well, they're very reliable. Um, but the zero MQ bindings for R, for example, are not so reliable. Um, and it's been a, a major source of problems for the R kernel is making that work well. Um, so that's a factor that weighs in favor of doing wrapper kernels rather than native kernels is native kernel. You have to have a zero MQ library in whatever language. Um, and capturing output live, so a lot of the kernels, like the bash kernel, for instance, at the moment, it will, um, when you run something, it will, you won't see anything until that cell has completely finished running, and then it will give you all the output as one block. Um, and doing that, getting the output live is more of a challenge. Uh, I'm going to skip over that because we're short on time. I want to get to the feature previews of new and upcoming stuff. Um, so I'm going to demo one thing, and then Min's going to come back on for the, for the finale. Um, so I've been working recently on going back to the terminal. So the in-development version of IPython and of Jupyter Console, which is our, um, our terminal front end for Jupyter, Jupyter kernels. Um, we've moved away from the read line library, which we were using for terminal interaction and tab completion and things, to a library called Prompt Toolkit, which means that, I don't know how visible this will be on the projector, but yes, I think you can see that there. So we now have uh, syntax highlighting happening live in the terminal, um, and also things like proper multi-line editing, so I can go up and down between lines here. <laughs> Thank you. If you're, 
If you're interested in that, come and find me afterwards to talk more about it. But now I'll hand back over to Min to demonstrate one or two other new things before we have to uh, go. Yeah, so another um, thing that we're working on for um, the 5.0 release of Jupiter. Um, so we're for being careful. We've, he did a demo from a stable version, um, and I get to run for master. So one of the things we're working on is refactoring all of the JavaScript. Um, we've, we've accumulated a bunch of JavaScript over the past uh, several years that is, let's say, um, less than optimal. And we're in the midst of, of rewriting the, the JavaScript side of a lot of the Jupyter stuff with more, more modern practices. And so we've got a bit of a new, new uh, UI for, for doing these things. And I can look in a nice little file browser. I can open an image that the SVGs don't work. But I can look at notebooks. And then these can be paneled and laid out. And we've got a, I can open a terminal and run my Python over here and open a new text file. And bring my text file over to this panel. And then and I've got a foreign keyboard. <laughs> What's the folder called? <laughs> oh, I am. Right, so I've got, you know, normal side by side terminal and and things and you can bring up bring up help in a side tab for this is on NB Viewer and collapse that. And then so that's Jupyter Lab that we've got coming, and it's very rough, but it's rapidly, rapidly getting nicer. And then the last bit is in a good old-fashioned notebook. We've got a markdown cell, and I want, let's say I want to put an image in there, um, but maybe I don't want to do it by a URL. I just want to maybe grab that image and just drag it over there. And then just drag images from your file system, and then they're embedded in the notebook. And this attachments thing, this is a cool thing. Was uh, I believe the person who put it together was their first contribution to Jupyter for, for anything. And he's put together a nice description of updates to the document format specification and then the implementation of the JavaScript. Um, yeah, that's really great. So I, for one, would just like to mention I'm excited about all this, and I can imagine many of you are. Would anyone have any questions to these two fine gentlemen who are working on this amazing, amazing, amazing project? Um, where do I find the Jupyter Lab? Uh, I, I just Googled it. it and it's, it's in the, the notebook repo in master. Yeah, OK, if you thanks. Install notebook from master. You'll get the silly button on there for try Jupyter Lab. Any other questions? <laughs> it's uh, not, no. uh, we're, we're, <laughs> we're running from my laptop, and uh, I don't have it set up. Um, yeah, installing Kling is a challenge. Because um, <laughs> you need like latest versions of LLVM, latest versions of Clang. Um, well, we should, we should emphasize installing Kling from the development version is a yes, challenge. Yes, that's true. It's, there hasn't been a release of Kling since this was added. If you, when there's table releases, you can just grab a, a, a binary, and it's fine. Um, but the, the kernel hasn't made it in, into a, a stable release yet. So you need to get it from master, and uh, that can be challenging. Yep. Okay. 
So I was wondering, how much of a penalty is there when you go from a Pandas data frame, for example, to an R data frame? Is there like an internal copy, or how, how does it work? There is an internal copy, um, so it doesn't, it's, it doesn't have to like dump it all to a CSV file and then read it back or something. It's, it's quicker than that. But yeah, there is, a, there is an in-memory copy, so it's you know, moving, moving data around and rearranging it into R's format, um, and that's, um, that's another thing that I, th I think RPy2 pr is now responsible for that. There was, at one point, both RPy2 and Pandas had separate implementations of that conversion. But I think it's I think it's our Py twos that's now used. Yeah, and I think that's that's one thing that um, when you're talking to Julia as opposed to R, um, Julia has an easier time talking natively to uh, a, a NumPy data layout. So you can you can have shared shared memory between Python and Julia uh, much more easily than you can with Python and R. Um, I'm not sure. Can you share an array in R? Yeah, I, th I think I think I think you can share a just not like, a data frame. Yeah, I think so. I think an array can work without copying. Uh, and in that case, I might have one more question. So there's a separate package for communicating between R and Python. Is there also such a thing necessary for Julia? Because Julia has an easy time importing some of the Python stuff, but pushing stuff from Julia to Python. Is that yeah. something that... Yeah, so there's two packages, um, one of which is very active um, and well-maintained, and that's PyCall. That's for calling Python from Julia. Um, the other is uh, the other direction, which is PyJulia, which is for calling Julia from Python, and we learned while putting together demos yesterday that that is not super well-maintained. <laughs> um, but it's in, in principle, um, and, and I, don't know, I don't know exactly the details of that, but... Um, so the library exists. It's in it's in a little bit of disrepair as Julia's moved on. You know, kind of moved out from under it a little bit. Um, but it's it's a small library, so maintaining it should, if if people are interested in it, should should be able to to catch it back up. Cool. Then, considering there are no more questions, can we get like two good rounds of applause? Because this is an amazing project, <laughs> and we are super happy that we have had you.